Hi, and welcome to part two. At first, radiative properties must seem like they are the simplest category of all. There's only three of them, which by definition all add together to one. So we can eliminate one of them arbitrarily and select the other two as the properties we care about. However, things are more complicated than that. The reason for this is because a greenhouse functions by having different responses to different frequencies of light. If it filtered out an even percentage of all the light passing through it, going both directions, the greenhouse would not function. Indeed, this would cause the outer material to actually reduce the greenhouse's ability to retain heat. In order for the greenhouse to be effective, it must let more light through in one direction than it does in the other. The way greenhouses accomplish this is with the material's frequency response. Since the light entering the greenhouse has bounced off the various objects inside, been absorbed or converted to other forms of radiation, it is often at a different frequency from the light entering from the outside. Therefore, good greenhouse materials will have a frequency response that makes them transparent to visible light, but opaque to infrared and other forms of radiation more likely to be found inside a greenhouse. This just leaves us with miscellaneous properties, all of which are fairly straightforward, useful, and easy to work with. We therefore can begin to combine terms into different indicator values. The cost of the material we can combine with the adder to cost from density to create our final effective cost value, while its response to weathering and fatigue can be combined with the mechanical properties earlier in order to determine the overall operational lifespan. The final miscellaneous factor, the permeability of the substance and its frame to air movement, we can combine with the R value to form an effective R value, measuring the material's overall insulative properties. So, now that we've determined what material properties are relevant to the problem, where do we go from here? Well, stepping back and looking at what we said earlier, we see that we're supposed to determine our goals in looking at these material properties. Use those to create combined values which we can more easily use to select materials, and then determine secondary objectives we can use to distinguish between materials that both perform well on our defined scale. In this case, our goal is to find variables that facilitate the analysis we talked about in the general structure video. And so what we're really concerned about is effectiveness per growing cycle and cost per growing cycle. With that in mind, we can combine cost and operational lifespan into an effective operational cost per season. In order to generate an effectiveness per season to compare this cost against, we wish to put the other material properties into a form that is convenient for the analysis we discussed in the general structure video. Since that analysis is based around conservation of energy, we want to put these into whatever form will most easily allow us to calculate their effect on energy conservation inside the greenhouse. In other words, we care about the total heat they retain or take from the environment. With this in mind, we combine our two insulative terms into one term that represents overall heat loss to the environment, while we combine our two radiative terms into one term representing overall energy retention. This cannot be performed in the general case, as both of these combination values depend on the external environmental conditions. However, if we have already gotten the external environmental conditions in table format, as we discussed in the general video, we can easily discuss effective values, calculating them using a computer. This gives us our three values for heat retention and overall cost, allowing us to calculate the material's cost effectiveness. What secondary objectives you pick depend on the details of your design. However, a common choice is maintenance. A material that needs to be replaced often will incur additional costs, both in maintenance time and in the fact that the greenhouse has to be shut down while it can be replaced. These steps are all that you require in order to find greenhouse materials for yourself. There's any number of material selection programs that can help you sort by a number of different material properties, including the ones we've explained here. However, in most cases, you won't want to sort through all possible materials selecting the best options, as there's a number of greenhouse materials that are already in popular use, having properties that are highly desirable for greenhouse construction. We'll give you a quick rundown of them now. The four most commonly used materials for greenhouse construction are glass, polycarbonate, polyethylene, and fiberglass. Each of them has different advantages, which we'll go over briefly. Glass, the classical greenhouse material, is well suited for the role. Being transparent to visible light but opaque to infrared, its radiative properties are well suited to the greenhouse role. 
Its high R value also makes it a good insulator. However, these advantages are often negated by the fact that it is expensive and heavy. Beyond just making it undesirable for monetary reasons, glass's weight means you can't have multiple layers of it. Its R value is good, but you might be better off with two or three layers of another substance rather than one of glass. Polyethylene, the loose plastic sheeting which many goods you've likely dealt with are made out of, is an excellent greenhouse material simply because it is cheap. Its radiative properties are acceptable, and it is an excellent insulator, particularly when multiple layers of it can be stacked. Its greatest disadvantage is its low functional life. It rapidly yellows under exposure to the sun, and the fact that it is not a solid medium means when exposed to severe climactic conditions, it can occasionally break or buckle. Furthermore, the yellowing means that rather than just needing to be replaced every three years, it will experience steadily decreasing quality of output until that period is over. In general, it's a good choice, but a very low budget one, and so is better added as a second layer to some other material, rather than used as a main material in of itself. Polycarbonate, polyethylene's more solid counterpart, suffers from many of the same problems and has many of the same strengths. It is cheap, light, has an excellent R value, and the fact that it is solid means that it eliminates many of polyethylene's buckling problems. However, it is also subject to yellowing, and without proper coating has an extremely short operational lifespan. Overall, polycarbonate is a slightly better choice than polyethylene, and so those who don't wish to pay for glass will often use it. It is one of the most commonly used materials in low-budget greenhouses. Fiberglass, the last material, is notable for being opaque rather than transparent, scattering light that passes through it. For this reason, it creates greenhouses that have no shadows or points of strong light concentration, making it desirable for plants that may be highly sensitive to sunlight conditions. However, outside this niche, it performs unfavorably, as it reflects a much higher percentage of the light that falls upon it than other materials. This concludes our video. In this video, we've attempted to give you an overview of material selection for a greenhouse outer layer, giving you the means to sort through all possible materials for the best choice, as well as a brief run-through of the four most common materials currently commercially used. Material selection for other parts of the greenhouse, such as the base or the support frame, is covered in the heating video, as those components primarily function as heat sinks.